Hello everybody, this is Christine, and I would like to welcome you to Footnoting History Does Footnoting Disney, Episode 2, Aladdin, but I also want you to know that this is our 7th anniversary. That's right, this episode marks 7 years since we first burst onto the podcasting world. And whether this is your first time listening to us or your 200th, we are so thankful that you are here. And of course, a big extra hug and kiss of gratitude to those of you who rally to our cry and have been supporting us through Patreon. We hope you're sporting your footnoting history merchandise with pride. And now, without further ado, here's Elizabeth to tell you about the history behind Aladdin. Did the story of Aladdin come from the imagination of an older French diplomat? Or was it based on the travels of a young Syrian man? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello listeners, and welcome to this installment of Footnoting Disney. This is Elizabeth, and in this episode, I will be taking you far behind the scenes of the Disney movie Aladdin. For those not familiar with the tale, I mean, I guess not everyone received the original soundtrack along with a CD Walkman for their 13th birthday, I will now provide a quick rundown. In the story Disney created, a young street rat named Aladdin is a diamond in the rough, who is the only one who can, therefore, successfully retrieve a magic lamp that contains a genie. Jafar, the sultan's vizier, meaning his main advisor, and who's actually an evil sorcerer, realizes that Aladdin is this key to getting the lamp and forces the orphan to retrieve it for him. Aladdin does successfully get said lamp, but shenanigans ensue. He's already fallen in love with Princess Jasmine, the sultan's daughter, whom he met when she escaped from the palace for an afternoon. Yada, yada, yada. Aladdin is truly a great guy and uses his last wish to free the genie. But... In a spectacular twist, Jafar is tricked by the genie and everyone gets a happy ending. Except for Jafar, who neither gets the lamp, the girl, or control of the country. Alright, so that's the Disney movie. For most of the general public, this is the story they know, and they believe it's part of a collection of fables contained in a work known as 1001 Nights, or in English, Arabian Nights. This belief is based on an early 18th century work in which Frenchman Antoine Gallon translated and published numerous stories from 13th to 15th century Syrian and Egyptian manuscripts. These stories are largely stories within stories as the main narrative, or to be technical, the framing device, is that of a young bride who is married to a sultan known for executing his wives the day after he marries them because of the infidelity of one of the wives. In order not to die, the wife of the stories, named Shahrazad, tells her husband fascinating stories that she never quite completes before it's time to fall asleep on the premise that he won't execute her in the morning so he can learn the ending. But because of the story within a story, there is no ending until, finally, the Sultan decides that he loves his wife so much he won't kill her. Like the 1001 Nights, both Disney versions of Aladdin use a framing device where someone is telling you the story. But here's the thing. Aladdin is not actually one of the stories found in pre-1700 collections of 1001 Nights. It's not one of the stories that Galand had an Egyptian or Syrian or Arabic manuscript for from the 13 to 1500s. As far as can be determined, Galland included in his collection some stories, such as Aladdin, that did not appear in manuscript sources. In fact, there's no evidence of any story about an Aladdin and his magical lamp in any source prior to Galland. Galland stated that he had been told these tales by a young Syrian man named Hana Daib as the young man traveled through France. But for centuries, Galland's explanation seemed like nothing more than complete fabrication used to try and give his stories legitimacy and a Middle Eastern flair. What this left us with is that in the late 20th century, it was assumed that Aladdin was a French invention inserted into the stories to help reach the number in the work's title, 1001. Although, spoiler alert, they were actually still really low. But regardless, that's what was assumed. In fact, this was the scholarly belief when Disney produced its animated film at the end of 1992. But then, it turns out everything we knew was wrong. In 1993, the year after Disney's animated Aladdin premiered, a memoir by an 18th century Syrian man named Hana Daib about his travels through France in the early 1700s was found in the Vatican archives. 
It then took about 10 to 20 years for this discovery to be fully digested and analyzed. Paolo Lemos Horta, a history professor at NYU Abu Dhabi, raises the idea in his 2017 work, Marvelous Thieves, and then again in his introduction for Yasmin Seal's 2018 translation of the Aladdin story, that the ragamuffin boy with the heart of gold who saw and experienced wondrous events was not just invented by Daib, but was to an extent an autobiographical retelling of the young man's travels with some magical touches added by him and Galant before the final product was created. And that brings us to an extremely condensed retelling of the story of Aladdin, based on the translation I read by French-Syrian linguist Yasmin Seal, which was published in 2018. You can, as I'm sure you would expect, find the link to the work on our further reading at www.footnotinghistory.com. So in the original tale, Aladdin is a poor but selfish only child raised in a Muslim kingdom in China. Why China, you ask? All right. In Europe, but also in West Asia, China was still seen at that point in time as a mysterious region and therefore home to many potential strange and magical events. Many of the stories in the original, if we can use that term, which I guess actually we shouldn't. So, okay. In the earlier versions of 1001 Nights, many were situated in China, and it was most likely because China was seen as wealthy and impressive, and that for many centuries, due to either geographic factors like mountains, and imperial policy, it had kept itself isolated off and on from the rest of Asia and the world. There was, therefore, scope for the imagination and also kind of like nobody was going to prove you wrong. Okay, so it's in China. Aladdin's father, a tailor, tried to inspire the boy to learn his father's craft, but Aladdin refused and the father died of a broken heart. After the father's death, a man came to Aladdin and his mother pretending to be his paternal uncle. After showering Aladdin and his mother with gifts, the man, who was actually a Maghrib wizard, invited Aladdin on a walk and used geomancy, a method of divination, to reveal a secret chamber in the ground. What were the Maghrib? Well, actually it should be, where was the Maghrib? Maghrib was a region of North Africa and was inhabited by Muslim Arabs, but some of our listeners may be more familiar with them as the term they were known by in Europe, the Moors. The more correct term for these people would be the Maghrabi, and it is that region that the wizard who tricks Aladdin was from. The wizard gives Aladdin a ring, tells the boy to enter the secret chamber and to take a lamp and to avoid anything else except for some quote-unquote fruit. Aladdin does so, but on his return he refuses to give over the lamp until the wizard helps him out of the chamber. And in his anger, the wizard, who will not help the boy out of the chamber because he's more interested in the lamp first, seals the boy and the lamp in the ground. A few days later, and near death, Aladdin inadvertently rubs the ring the wizard gave him, and out pops a jinni who, at Aladdin's request, saves him. In Islam, jinn are supernatural beings who are different from angels and demons, and there are a few other stories from 1001 Nights where they play an important role. Once safely returned home, Aladdin and his mother discover that by rubbing the lamp, they can also summon a second jinni to do their bidding. While Aladdin and his mom use the genie somewhat to their advantage, in many ways seeming to be dreaming small, until it is, Aladdin sneaks into a forbidden place and sees the Sultan's daughter unveiled. He is smitten, and through genie-involved machinations, not only ends up married to the princess, but also has the most impressive palace in China. Over time, Aladdin makes himself a much-beloved prince as he visits the public and becomes known for his kindness. But his story isn't done yet. The evil wizard returns, tricks the princess out of the lamp, steals the palace and his wife, and Aladdin uses the genie in his rings to right these wrongs and also trick the wizard into drinking a poisoned goblet of wine. But wait, there's more. You see, the wizard had a brother, and when the wizard used magic and learns of his brother's death, he wants revenge. I know, it's starting to become really easy to see how this story could break off at just an exciting moment and leave you hanging until the next night. So this second wizard, kills a holy woman named Fatima, disguises himself as her, and uses the holy woman's reputation to gain entrance to Aladdin's palace. But a few missteps and Aladdin learns of the subterfuge and kills the wizard. The story finishes quickly after this, with the princess inheriting the kingdom as she has no brothers, and she and Aladdin rule it well, and the line continues after the, their death. There is a postscript, however. Shahrazad, the storyteller, takes a moment to explain the moral of the tale to her husband, the Sultan, before ensuring him that she has, as always, more stories to tell. Now, as I said earlier, the story that I just told you is now considered to be an amalgamation of Galant and Daiv's experiences, which means we now need to turn towards those experiences to better understand from where came the story of Aladdin. 
We're going to go in age order and start with Galon, who, by the time he recorded or wrote, depending on your interpretation, the story of Aladdin, he was already in his mid-60s. Galon was born in the 1640s in France. At age 25, he was appointed to be a member of the French embassy to Istanbul due to his knowledge of languages such as Greek and Arabic. Galon's diplomatic mission's goal was to preserve the special protections of the French merchants in the Ottoman Empire and also to make sure that Christians in the Ottoman Empire were being well cared for. It is assumed by Horta, the historian from NYU Abu Dhabi that I mentioned earlier, that the accounts in Aladdin of processions were based on Galland's time in the Ottoman court, as the diplomat often wrote of the impressive pageantry. Also, Galland was there to get information that supported the Catholics in their war against Protestantism. I mean, it's the 1600s. Eventually, he became responsible for collecting manuscripts and antiquities for Louis XIV, King of France. The motivation behind the collection was making sure that France was just as up-to-date with having exotic materials as the other European kingdoms. While most students might recognize the name Jean-Baptiste Colbert as Louis XIV's finance minister, who was constantly trying to balance the French budget, Colbert was also responsible for helping to create and expand Louis XIV's collection, and he was Galland's boss in this endeavor. Colbert felt like ancient Greek and Latin manuscripts were super well represented in Europe, Instead, Colbert's instructions to Galland were to buy manuscripts on medicine, history, and geography in any language as long as the manuscripts were complete and in perfect condition. You'll notice I did not just say, buy a whole lot of fairy tales. Galland's purchases were not with his own money, therefore, but at the behest of Colbert for various patrons back in France, including the French East India Company. And here's a confession. Until this moment, I'm not sure I knew there was a French East India Company, as it's overshadowed in my brain by the Dutch and British East India Companies. So just to let you know, and myself, the French East India Company was the brainchild of Colbert, and it was Colbert and the French East India Company who paid for Galland's third voyage to the East. But there was a caveat. Galland couldn't buy texts of the Quran, lives of the Prophet, or Arabic works of poetry or fiction, because according to Colbert, France had enough of those. But Galland kept wanting to go off script because of the fabulous works he found. Over the next few decades, Galland continued to hear more and more stories, and in 1701 he bought a collection of 282 tales from a Syrian friend. These tales became the core of the work known as 1001 Nights, and Galland translated them over the next 16 years, and he published them in 12 volumes, but he renamed them Arabian Nights. Galland, you see, was what we term an Orientalist. The word Oriental, which is French in origin, originally just meant the East, and the term for the West was the Occident. Over time, the Orient became somewhat synonymous with East Asia, and those interested in the Orient studied Arabic, Islamic, and Indian languages and history. During the 18th and 19th centuries, learned European men worked to be just as educated in Eastern studies as they were about Western history and literature. Galland, therefore, was ahead of his time, but not by too much. He became an important and early figure in Orientalist studies, and by 1709, he held a professorship of Arabic at La Collège Royale, now known as the Collège de France, a university established in the 1530s, which sits just across the street from the Sorbonne. The school was largely intended for linguists, and it's unsurprising that Galland would join them. By 1709, the same year he was granted this professorship, he had already published seven volumes of Arabian Nights. However, he felt like he just didn't have enough stories for his collection. Again, it was the 1001 nights, not the 282 nights. That number 282 was just so unsatisfying. And then, on March 25th, 1709, he met a young Syrian man, also a linguist, at the Paris apartment of Paul Lucas. Lucas, also known as a collector of curiosities and antiquity, really deserves his own episode. But unfortunately, we just don't have the time for that right now. So let me just mention that Daib, the young Syrian man, believed, at least according to his memoir, that Lucas owned the elixir of life and could miraculously heal people. I told you, he needs his own episode. Anyway, back to Galan and this chance meeting that quickly evolved into 12 meetings between May 5th and June 2nd, 1709, during which the young man, Hannah Daib, told Galan 16 stories. Galan picked 10 of these stories for the final three volumes of his work, and one such story has become one of the most popular of the Arabian Nights. Yeah, you've guessed it, Aladdin. Scholars refer to the Daib stories as the orphan tales because they have no Arabic manuscript source. It's also hard to say where Daib's stories end and Galan's begin. 
So it seems like this is as good a time as any to turn our attention to that young man, Hannah Daib, whose memoir that he wrote as an old man and was found in the Vatican archives in the 1990s completely upended what we thought we knew. Very recently, and I mean January 2020 recently, there has been published an English translation of the memoir. This translation is so recent that I actually haven't looked at it yet. When I wrote this, the only translation I could find was in French, and that was interesting. But the link to this work is on our further reading. If you get a chance to read it, let us know what you think. Before I recount Daib's life story, I should note again that he wrote it between 1763 to 1764 when he was about 75, and the section that we are largely interested in took place when he was 20 in 1709. The memoir, therefore, is largely based on memories from decades before. Okay, so we've put that out there. Daib was born in Aleppo, a trading city in Syria, into a Christian Maronite family. The Maronite church is traditionally part of the Eastern Christian faith, but it's also officially part of the Roman Catholic Church. Adherents were super into miracles and the Blessed Virgin, who is also known as Mary, the mother of Jesus. Like Aladdin, Daib's father died when he was a boy, and later he worked for a French merchant. Daib's family's social class had a lot of interaction with Europeans, and as a resident of Aleppo, Daib was exposed to stories from the Levant as well as India, China, France, and Italy. These stories were often told in coffee houses, and while they might not have been as ubiquitous back then as, say, like Starbucks today, Aleppo had its fair share with at least 60 coffee houses during this period. My favorite part of the coffee house experience in Syria was that it mimicked the framing tale from 1001 Nights. At the coffee houses, storytellers would begin their stories, get the crowds invested and riled up, and then, just as the most exciting moment, they would throw down their arms and leave the establishment not to return until the next night. Angry customers would argue with each other about what was going to come next. It's basically the pre-television version of To Be Continued. Daib was fluent in Arabic, French, Provençal, Italian, and Turkish. As a teen, he joined a monastery for a quick minute, but within a few short months realized that wasn't for him. And then in 1707, he met Paul Lucas and traveled through Lebanon, Cyprus, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Italy, and finally France. On their journey, they met pirates and robbers. They also, at times, under Lucas's direction, became robbers themselves, although their goal was often tombs. In his memoirs, Daib relates a story of how they came upon a cave that was too narrow for an adult to fit into, and so Lucas hired a young boy who entered the opening and then returned with a lamp and a ring. Sound familiar? Well, that's not the only time that Lucas plays a role in Aladdin. At the onset of their journey, Lucas had promised Daib a job as librarian of Arabic in the French royal collections, but it didn't happen. And it's possible that the Maghrebi wizard who tricked Aladdin and his mother was based on this Frenchman. But while Lucas didn't get Daib the position he promised, he did present him to the king at Versailles, and as evident from Daib's memoir, he was incredibly impressed by the palace, its ground, and its princesses. There could be an additional connection between Daib and Versailles. In the palace that Aladdin built, he included a room of 24 windows that was decorated with gems that no one but a magical genie could create. As I read, all I could think about was the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. For World War I buffs, it's in the Hall of Mirrors that the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919. The Hall of Mirrors, which includes 357 mirrors and 17 arches, was built between 1678 and 1684, so Daib most likely saw it on his tour there 25 years later, and when he met Galland, it may have influenced the palace he described Aladdin's genie as creating. In March 1709, Daib met Galland at Lucas's Paris apartment, and on learning that Galland was running out of stories, Daib told him tales to be helpful. Even though Galland was also a linguist, they conversed in French. In his memoir, Daib refers to Galland just as old man, and this is the old man to whom he helped out by telling him stories to complete his work. Seems that Daib did not know what collection some of his tales went into, nor did he actually become aware of the impact these stories had on French and then European literary culture. In 1710, he returned to Aleppo, joined the family textile business, and opened a shop with the help of his brother. About seven years later, Daib married, and by 1950 he lived in one of the largest houses in his community. Galan was not the only one Daib told stories to. In his memoir, Daib describes wowing the residents of Aleppo with his story of Italy. By the end of his life, he was also a book collector and author. As Horta explains, Daib's background represented the overlapping worlds of the East and the West. 
And although Galland might have been trying to create Oriental stories, the stories reflect not only Daïb's childhood and adolescence in Aleppo, but also his travels and impressions of France. The story of Aladdin, therefore, is one in which we see magic and wonder presented across cultures. You may even say that together, Daïb and Galland created a whole new world. Interested in owning some footnoting history merch? You can find out more through our shop link at www.footnotinghistory.com. Want to support the show and keep it open access? Our Patreon is at patreon.com forward slash footnoting underscore history. You can also follow us on Twitter at History Footnote or on Facebook and Instagram at Footnoting History. And of course, the best stories are always in the footnotes.